Thank you for joining us at First Assembly of God Church in Clear Lake, California. Please welcome our associate pastor, Chris Massengill. Stan, how many were here on Wednesday? Oh, wow, a grand majority of you. Okay, so, you know when you watch a really good movie and you get so much out of it, then you want to watch it again and you get more out of it? Well, this is what it's going to be for you today, okay? Because I warned you I was going to leave, because my wife's like, you just kind of left them hanging. I said, but I told them I was going to do that, yeah. that I was going to take you swimming, and I was just going to leave you in the water till, till Sunday, then we're going to bring it back and close it. So, you know, I kind of was going to take Wednesday night and recap it a little bit for Sunday morning, and so um, there's not much I can recap and make sense. So you're kind of going to get it all over again in a quick term, okay? You know, I can speak really quick, if you can't tell. So you might hear some things, you might hear some new stuff, Amen. Yeah, so um, how many are glad to be in church this morning? How many came expecting this morning? All right. So uh, you glad to be in 2024? Okay, so um, I just got to share this with you. I shared it on Wednesday night, but the majority of us here, and it comes more to clear to the picture, is that um, if you remember the Sunday, the last Sunday I preached back in 19 or 2023. was the Sunday before Christmas. And God didn't mention to me to say that I'm not a prophet, nor do I need to prophesy, nor am I a, a biblical theologian, but I didn't need to be brilliant to realize that when this little church on top of this hill hit 200 people, that we as a church would be in a test. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. And so that being said there, um, next Sunday that we had was Christmas Sunday morning. And so we had our one service, and we were all in here worshiping together for Christmas, and three different people count, and none of them kind of coursed together, but three different people counted. I asked three different people how many people were in church today, and do you know what the number was? 200. Not 198, not 204, not any, it was 200. That's the way God moves and speaks to his people. It was exactly 200. So I'm telling you right now, as the body of Christ, as the church on top of the hill, we as a body, we as a church family are going to enter into a testing time until his word comes to pass. Okay, so what that, what that means is, is that don't get offended. You know, one thing about churches this size, this many people, uh, it's full of people. And, um, and, you know, and if you get offended, don't jump off the cliff. Don't run out the building. Don't leave the church. Just kind of work it out. That's what we do as family, right? Our family, we bump heads. We, we say a bunch of nonsense, but then we come back and we work it out because we're family. So we're going to get through this test. Today. We're going to get through this test. And, you know, I might say something that's off kilter. Pastor Steve might say something. We're all... We're all to do something here, but don't jump off the cliff, okay? We're going to get through this test. We're going to make it through because what God has planned for this church on top of this hill is way more grander than you can even fathom. Kind of like our bathrooms. <laughs> Let's be honest. Did anyone ever expect them bathrooms to be like that? Yeah. Right? You had your little picture in your mind what they could be. The ladies were so upset because they didn't get any input on what they were going to do in those bathrooms. And I told my wife at the woman's ministry, I said, tell them they can't even fathom how, brutal, how good those bathrooms are going to be. Right? And they, they couldn't even picture it in their mind how grand those bathrooms would be. Then you've got to ask yourself, being prophetic, is how come at that time, before this time here, before the word come to pass, that we decided to put in new state-of-the-art bathrooms with handicap stalls and automatic flushes and nice tile floors that could be washed out because of mass abuse. And what about, what about the time when we decided in the middle of winter that we really needed to repave our parking lot, even though we only had about 70 people, 80 people on the average on a service, we decided to go ahead and drop the, <laughs> yeah, it was not cheap, um, the money to pave our parking lot. But how many of you today are glad that we're paved all the way out to the fence? Because I can guarantee you the parking guys out there trying to keep you in place because there's not enough parking out there for everybody that's here today. Oh, can you see the picture now? I'm just give you this. I'm going to give you a little word of advice. I've been saying it for a while now, especially to all the leadership. You will be provoked. Do not engage. All right, let's get this party started. 
The sermon started. Sorry, Pastor. <laughs> Take that out, Jacob. Psalms 105, 17 through 19. You're like, again? Yeah, sometimes it just happens that way. I don't know. Let's read it. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time that his word, whose word? Joseph's word came to pass. Little h, not big h. The word of the Lord tested him. So today we're going to go back and talk about something, about the chaos of delay versus the cosmos of a promise. The chaos of delay. Remember, we talked about delay versus the cosmos of the promise. What do you mean, Pastor Chris? Well, when you go through something on the way to the fulfillment of your promise, when you walk towards your promise, you always go through a season that feels very chaotic. The question is, is that normal? The chaos of delay versus the cosmos of the promise. You got quiet in this Pentecostal church. Whenever a promise comes to pass, it feels very ordered. You're right where you're supposed to be. This is great. Everything's great. Prior to that, it feels very chaotic. Here's the problem. Picture on the wall? Because I know you can't see that in the back. Here's the picture your life. God created you with a purpose, and with the purpose comes a promise. So God paints a picture of your life. I kind of like that one. I like the water and the red barn and all that. The rainbow, the rainbow yes. I would use my other picture of the rainbow when they showed my house burning. I want you to say something, but my house, my house burned down in 16. They were standing on the street spraying a water hose on it, and all there was was this black smoke, and in this black smoke was a rainbow. Pay attention. And so my wife took that picture, and she copied it, and what did she put on it? The promise. Whoa, just saying. You thought she wasn't a prophet. No. <laughs> Should have used that one. Problem is, there's some laws that govern the universe. One of those laws is called thermodynamics. Anybody here ever heard of this? All right. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Does anybody know the second law of thermodynamics? Entropy. There you go, it's on the wall. Everything devolves. What's that mean, Pastor Chris? Everything devolves into chaos and disorder. It always starts with order, then goes to chaos. Never goes from chaos to order, scientifically speaking. How they believe in, 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 in evolution, I don't know. They must believe in two different things. Right, Pastor? Pastor brought that to me. goes, you think, why do they believe in evolution? If, they, if science says it goes from order to chaos, well, that's just the opposite. What do you guys believe? They don't even know what they believe. No wonder they can believe in it. <laughs> things, yeah, they're things. So we go from order to chaos, which is the title of your message. Everything starts with order. Goes from order to chaos. Because there's something in the scientific realm that all science is governed by. It's called the arrow of time. All science. It encompasses every area of science. The arrow of time. And there is a process that cannot be stopped or reversed. Where have you heard that before? For two years we've been saying, you're not going to be able to stop what God has planned for this church on top of this hill. There is a process. You cannot stop or be reversed. With this arrow of time comes the second law, thermodynamics, entropy. It's everything eventually devolves and degrades into chaos. 
share one more thing with you because we have time. Before COVID, pre-early 19, God had given me a vision. And through things that were taking place, I was very um, disappointed at the way things were going. I was struggling. I was uh, thinking it was never going to happen. Um, almost threw the baby away with the bath water. And God sent a man to the church because he was going to save Lake County through these revivals we were going to do. And uh, I was mad because he wanted to be here at 1 o'clock, 1.30, and Pastor Steve asked me if I could be here, and I'm like, dude, 1 o'clock's my gym time. And that's before I owned the gym. And so I was like, all right, I'll stay because I'll do anything Pastor asked me to do. And uh, it's a yes relationship, by the way. And so I'm sitting in there, and he asked Pastor, and he asked, he asked everybody in the place what their story was. They gave him the story. There's a group of us sitting there. He looks at me, and he goes, he goes, so, Chris, what's your story? I go, well, I owned an auto repair shop for 20 years. I retired and went to work for God and Pastor Steve full time. I moved on. And as he's speaking, he stops. He goes, can I say something to you, Chris? And so I'm like, sure, go ahead. Oh, I got an attitude. You know, every, every, everybody wants to come save Lake County, but nobody wants to live here. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> right? And so he goes, you've had a dream. You've had a vision. And you're really, really bummed out about the way things are going right now. But basically, he said, you need to get over yourself because you're going to see that dream come to pass. The arrow of time. Five years later. Chaos. COVID happened shortly after that. Church shut down. Things happening. House burns down. All kinds of stuff. Chaos. Order to chaos. But no matter what, no matter when that arrow is shot, no matter how fast it travels, it's going to sooner or later land. Can you see what I'm saying today? Can you just look around for a moment? Let's see if I can get back on my notes. Let's go back to the original scripture, Psalms 105, 17 through 19. He sent a man before them, Joseph. There's order. God calls Joseph, gives him a vision, tells him you're going to reign and rule. Your brothers and people are going to bow down to you. You're going to be second to Pharaoh. Right? He's got, here's, here's the order. God ordained a plan for Joseph. Can you see it? He's living in a house. He's got a daddy. He's not worried about where his next meal is coming from. He's got favor on his life. There's order. There's order. And the Bible says he's sold into slavery. The arrow of time. God launches him from here to over there. When you are born, you were conceived supernaturally by God. You're in your mother's womb. The moment that you come out of your mother's womb, you're born into a natural world where you are bound by the laws of nature. Right? God has a purpose and a plan for your life. He doesn't create anything without purpose. And with that purpose comes promise. But then you're born into this thing that we call the world. This is why you need to be born again. From that time to that time, you, have, you are, have to be under the laws of natural law because we live in a natural world. It isn't until that you get born again and ask God to come into your situation so that you can operate in the spiritual realm because we're not part of this world. We live in it, but we're not of it. Are you staying with me? Okay. So Joseph gets a picture, and eventually it goes into entropy. He sold into slavery. If you ever read the story, you can see he went to prison. Potiphar's wife tried to hook up with him. Caused him more problems. We get it. If we study thermodynamics, that's the second law of thermodynamics, entropy. That's what happens in a natural world. 
It's working right there in the promise that God gave him. The problem with this passage is the last half of the passage. It violates natural law. Check it out. It says, until the time his word, Joseph's word, came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. Remember, it cannot be stopped or reversed unless God intervenes. So we're going to go into a scripture today that will really mess your thinking up concerning the laws of thermodynamics. Before we do that, though, I'm going to give you a demonstration. Still with me? Yeah. Shall, yes. yes. Okay, so five of you are with me. Can I want me to redo it again? Okay, say, Pastor Chris is about to teach us something now. Okay, you ready? Yes. So there's this law in the universe called thermodynamics that rules and reigns and governs what happens here in the natural. And so if I was to take this puzzle, which is the picture of your life, God's purpose for you, you have your purpose. There's a plan set out before you. You're born into a natural world. If we take this puzzle, your life, your plan, and your purpose, as it goes into the natural world, <laughs> 350 pieces right there in that pile. That's your life. This is your life. Now, the laws, it's all right. It'll be all right. We'll get them later. I might take that one and remind you of this message. <laughs> so the laws in the universe is, if I was to take that puzzle and put it together and break it and stack it in pieces right on top, order, perfect order, and I was to drop it out like that, when it landed on that table... The two pieces that go together would be the farthest apart. Always. That's natural law. The laws of thermodynamics. But no matter how much order I put it together, if I put it as a picture and turned it over and banged it on the table, when it landed, they would fall apart. And the two pieces that go together would be the farthest apart. Now you need to look with your spiritual eyes and hear with your spiritual ears on this one. You're thinking, what does that have to do with anything? What God does is God gives you a picture, a calling, the dream, a promise. You have this thing birthed in your heart. You think it's going to come to pass tomorrow. You come to church one day and God gives you a word. He gives you a picture. You think it's going to come to pass Tomorrow. The problem is God gives you the picture, and you know what he does? Shakes up the puzzle, dumps it out, and the laws that govern the universe govern the fall of those people, those, those parts, as far apart as possible. You still with me? Yes. So now you get to spend the rest of your life trying to figure out how to put the puzzle of your life together. Are you with me still? Am I talking to somebody? Yeah. So how many of you here feel this is where you're at right now? You know you got a promise over your life, and you're trying to figure out how to put the puzzle together. You just ain't got a clue. Two of you out of 170. That's pretty good. <laughs> Maybe we should just go home right now. We've all got it figured out. <laughs> you know you go to hell for lying in church. It's where you're at right now, trying to figure out how to put the pieces together. We're going to try to help you out here. We're going to give you my favorite verse in the Bible, probably yours too. And it's misquote all the time, Romans 8, 28. Are you ready for this? We're going to go with the King James Version. And for those here on Wednesday, we're going to do it again, so be prepared for it, Okay. Read that out loud for me. Stop. Stop. Stop, stop, stop. All things 
don't work together. I don't care who you are. If you're over 12 years old, you know that all things don't work together. Right? I'm going to submit to you today. If I take these two things, two pieces of our puzzle, and I put them together, They're just two blue things. They're just two blue things. Things don't do nothing. Things are, an, are not inanimate objects. They have no life in themselves. Things do nothing. So for the scripture to say all things work together... Things don't do nothing. I'm going somewhere here. Don't leave me today. If you don't believe me, go do something dumb, some dumb thing, and see if that thing comes straightens out by itself. Let's read it again. Ready? And we know that all things work together for good. Not for everybody. Not for everybody. What's it say? For those who love God, saved, born again, and called according to his purpose. Okay, you still with me? Okay. So this, King James Version, some say I can go to hell for saying this, it's kind of a bad translation. The NIV and the New Living Translation is actually closer to the actual Greek that it's written in. Romans 8.28 in the NIV translation says, And we know that in all things God works for good for those who love him and called according to his purpose. He works, God works in. Can somebody tell me the difference between NIV and the King James Version? Things don't do nothing. But God, when you allow him to come in and you give him permission to work in your life, you're born again, you're saved, comes in all things of your life into your puzzle and starts working these things together for the good who are called according to his purpose, which is your picture. Are you staying with me now? You're like, why have I been through all I've been through? Well, that's why. God never waits to hurt. Everything that you have went through and you have survived, God is going to use it for his glory to minister to somebody else. Okay, where are we at? Oh, no. So God works all things. Things don't work, but God works all things. Good things, bad things, right things, wrong things, dark things. Things don't do nothing but devolve, dissolve, devolve, yeah. Too many words today. God is the only one who has the ability to work outside and against the laws of nature. God is the only one that can work outside and against the laws of nature. Which demands if your life starts with a promise, it's a whole picture. It's the whole picture. God sees it. It's there. And yet it evolves into what you think is chaos. But what God does, he comes down and things don't work together. God gets in the middle of things and he starts putting his pieces of the puzzle together for your life. So that you can see the picture. I can see the picture. The problem is, is when he puts the two pieces together, two blue things. But the closer you get to the promise, the more of the picture, the dream, the desire, begins to take shape. 
God brings order out of the chaos. Like he did in Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness, deep darkness, was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. Who was over the, the water? The Spirit of God. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit began to move. The Holy Spirit began to move. You want to know why you have to be born again? Because you need the Holy Spirit in your life so he can move to help you in the situation of your life. You can't do this by yourself. You need to be born again. You struggling? Get saved. He says the Holy Spirit brought order in the midst of the chaotic waters. He brought order. He begins to speak to darkness. Darkness, you can't rule no more. Oh, that should be for somebody's life right now. Holy Spirit says, darkness, you can't rule no more. You have no authority anymore. You might as well kick rocks. Leave this person alone. Let there be light. Deep darkness covers the earth. Let our light shine. Oh, I couldn't put that together, and I don't think that far ahead. Most of you know me. I can't think 15 minutes past. <laughs> God speaks to the earth, says, let there be dry ground, because everything was covered in water. He brought order out of the chaos. I'm going to tell you today, if your life is chaotic, and you feel like you're in the middle of that zone, where all the pieces of your puzzle are not making sense, God will work in all things, in all things, for the good. Not for everybody. For those who love him, saved, and are called according to his purpose. Somebody ought to shout in the Pentecostal church. Yeah. There you go. But I like the New Living Translation better. The New Living Translation, Romans 8, 28, and this is actually closer to the Greek than any of them, says, it says that God doesn't just work in. He doesn't just work in. It says, and we know that God causes everything. Say everything. everything. Good things, bad things, right things, wrong things, peaceful things, chaotic things, ordered things. God causes good relationships, bad relationships, the right people, the wrong people, the right church, the wrong church. He causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Amen. You got a dream? You got a desire? Feel like you got a promise over your life? Can I just give you some, a way to show you that we know that God intervened in the writing of the Bible, that the Holy Spirit inspired the writers of this Bible, and I prove it to you today. Is that okay with you? Romans 8, 28, New King James Version says that we know that all things, everybody say all things, all things. work together for good for those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. So we're going to deal with three different words today. The first one we're going to start with is things. God works all things. Everybody say all things. All things. Whenever God talks about things in the Koine Greek, it's what the New Testament is written in for those who didn't know. There are two different words that can be used for things. You've got to stay with me on this one. This is where you've got to believe that the Holy Spirit is the one who wrote the Bible. Divinely inspired. Not man. Not man. Because Paul could have grabbed any word, but instead he grabbed specific words in the Greek language to make a statement. So the first word that he could have used for things is holy. Like guacamole. Holy. Not mole, I said holy. I think I had him put a dash at the E so you would know that it was separate. Holy means the total. You got to pay attention here because you're going to get lost. The total of everything. This is where we get the word whole. But Paul didn't use this word. Instead, Paul uses the word penta, which means each and everything. Oh, you've got to stay with me. 
he used the word panta, which means each and everything. So when you're chasing your dream, the Holy Spirit, if you're born again, the Holy Spirit uses each and every little thing that you've been through to make your purpose come to pass. God's not just saying, no, no, don't worry about it. You're going to get there sooner or later because it's going to be that way. That's holy. No, he says, I want you to know something. You're worried about this piece and this piece and this piece and this piece and how we're going to put these pieces together. And God wants you to know that he gets in the middle of each and every little thing of your life and he starts causing, everybody say causes, Start your pieces to come together. Here's the problem. Here's why you're so frustrated today. You're trying to put this puzzle together yourself. Starting to sound like a Pentecostal church now, huh? You know, that's encouraging to us when you shout. Like, oh, man, this is deep. I lost him. I think to back it up for 2024. I thought I could expand a little further. I'm trying to see how far I can go before I lose you. God's saying, if you take your hands off it and trust me, take your hands off it and trust me, that's where the writer of Hebrews meant when he said, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's all things. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Can I go on to the next word? Yeah. Remember, I'm only going to do three words today, so you're going to be out of here on time. Well, yeah, I better speed it up. Okay. <laughs> you love that, huh? All right. Works together. Everybody say works together. This phrase, works together, first of all in the Greek, is singular. What do you mean? It doesn't just works, it worked. Did you get it? It doesn't just works together, it worked together. Everything that you have been through, every problem, every hurt, every pain, every joy, every amazing thing, bad thing, horrible thing, God worked it together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Amen. 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 Now we're talking. Yeah. Okay. Nothing outside his sovereignty. There is nothing outside his sovereignty when it comes to it. God is sovereign. Here's the word that he did use. Is that where we're at? For things. He uses the word synergo. I'm trying to remember it off of Google. Synergo. Try to say it like it's spelled. Ergo is where we get the word energy. Sun means with. So when we put the word sun and ergo, how are we going to say that? Together is where we get this word synergy. So what's the definition of synergy? Well, I'm glad you asked. You ready? I think it's on the board. All right, the interaction or cooperation of two or more organizations, organizations, substances, or other agents to produce a combined effect greater than the sum of their separate effects. You know what that's saying right there? That when we get him involved in our picture, in our promise, that synergy, he causes everything in your life to synergy together for good. The interaction and cooperation of two or more organizations, me, him, Holy Spirit, substance or other agents to produce a combined effect greater than the sum of their separate effects. So remember we talked about entropy, how everything devolves. 
how the pieces of your puzzle separate when I drop it, and they get farther and farther apart. Natural law. God says, don't worry about natural laws, because let me tell you how I do things. How I do things. Say things. things. That's where we're at, right? Whenever the pieces are all over the place in your life, I'm talking to somebody right now, yeah. and you got a word, a dream, a promise over your life, let me tell you what I do, what God would do. He creates a synergy. With every single piece, that all of a sudden they start coming together, and each and every one of them start coming together to fill what he has called you and anointed you to do. Yeah. Say, I'm anointed. So, church, everybody's running around, going to conferences, trying to figure out how to get synergy in their life. I'm going to tell you how to get synergy in your life. As a believer, follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is working in all things, causing all things to work together for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Pretty deep, Pastor Chris. I got one more word. Can I do one more word? Yeah. For the good. Everybody say good. good. Now, this is the interesting part because there are three words Paul could have used here for the word good in the Greek. The first word Paul uses, could have used, is kalos. It means aesthetically pretty, beautiful from the outside, free of defe from defects, like my wife, Teresa. <laughs> kalos. I had to use it. It's good, right? I'm, I'm, hey, I, I'm, get, I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that. Hang on. Kalos. But that's not the word he used. Hang on. I might be eating lunch with somebody else today. <laughs> now watch. He could have used the word Christos, which means pleasant. <laughs> pleasant to talk to, pleasant to look. No, oh, let's go on. Anyway. Christos. You know, somebody can be aesthetically good, but not very pleasant to be around. You guys ready? We're almost done. So here's the third word he uses. This is the word that he actually uses. It's agathos. Is this is actually the word that's in your Bible. It means good from God's perspective. Not good to my perspective, not good to Pastor Steve's perspective, not good to y'all's perspective, good to his perspective. Amen. That is powerful enough in itself. Good by his perspective, not our perspective. Watch as God causes all things, no matter how chaotic, what it seems like, what it feels like in your life, he causes each and every little thing, synergy, based on his good, his perspective for your life. You look at the puzzle. Now we're getting deep here. You think it's better this way. You know how people are. You can tell somebody, I want you to paint this pulpit. I want you to paint right here. Leave the rest. Paint this right here. I leave you a can of paint. I run off, go to the store, do a couple errands, I come back, and I come back, and the whole thing is painted black. What, 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 what? Why'd you do that? Well, I thought that it looked better all painted. Come on now, somebody, you know that's you. I felt that it's better painted the whole thing, so I just went ahead and painted the whole thing. Didn't need to ask you. This is how we live our life with him. I think I need to do this. My life would be better. My life would be better if I did it this way. Or if I did it that way. It would look better this way. If I only had that. Church, we are called according to his divine purpose. He created us with a purpose, a plan, and a picture for our life. 
Those of us in this room who are born again have a high calling of God on our life. You are a chosen generation, the Bible says. A royal priesthood who is called to show the praises of his name. Your life, if you are born again, does not belong to you anymore. You surrendered him that day when you said that prayer. Your life is no longer your business. Let it go. Because there is a picture, a dream, a plan that God has for you that is so pretty from his perspective that when he puts it together, everybody that knows you, everybody that knows you, when he gets done with it and they look at the picture and they know where you came from, they know what you walked through, they know the rejection that you suffered. They saw the pain. They saw the decisions. They seen the choices. And they said, there ain't no way in the world that you're ever going to do what God has called you to do. Can I get the altar team to come up? There's no way in the world that your life is ever going to amount to anything. When the people that know you, they've walked beside you, they've seen everything that has happened in your life, you begin to come to church, and they're like, there ain't no way anything's going to change, and they're going to be the same, nothing's ever going to change. But let me tell you today, when you make that decision to come to Jesus, when you decide that I can't put this thing together no more, I'm tired of living in the chaos and, 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 the, and the entropy and all the things that are going on, one problem after another, one test after another. I, I don't know where I'm going, what I'm going to do. I got nothing to offer. And you get to that point. You say, Jesus, I can't. You can. I'm going to let you. You come and you say, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, be in my life. Holy Spirit, I give my life to you. I surrender my life. In other words, it's not your business anymore. And what happens is immediately, everybody say immediately. immediately. That's what God in heaven does, comes down into the pieces, the broken pieces, the chaotic pieces, the separated pieces. And the arrow of time that has caused entropy in your life this thing that has caused everything in your life to devolve into what we call chaos, the laws of nature. Those things that have come into your life and blown it all apart. And you thought, I'll never be able to do what God has called me to do. The window is passed. I'm too old. I missed the opportunity. God says, no, no, no. You don't understand because when I get involved in every little detail of your life, each and every little thing, the rejection, the divorce, the person who walked out on you and they should have stayed with you, the bad decisions that you made, He says, don't worry about it. When you give your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit can redeem every single aspect of your life. He can redeem even the time. God is able to reverse the arrow of time for you. Good things, bad things, right things. Some of you are in this place today, you know, I don't believe God can do that for me. You don't understand, Pastor Chris, what I've done, where I've been, how far I've gone, the people I've hurt. My family don't want anything to do with me anymore. 
I know one that loves me. I burnt every bridge. Yeah, you and me both. But I can tell you that if you let God get in the middle of that, He can repair all the relationships. He can redeem the time that you love. As my kids grown up and I didn't spend any time with them, God can redeem that time for you. Some of you have been working for 20 years trying to make something come to pass. I'm here to tell you, if you get God involved, he can make it come to pass in two minutes. God can redeem the time for you today before you leave this building. His presence is here right now to touch you. Bree? Stand right there. Stand right there. God wants to set you free today. He wants to set you free in your mind. The dark cloud of oppression does not have authority in your life anymore. In the name of Jesus, we've taken authority over the dark things that have been plaguing you. The unusual illnesses. This lingering thing that seems to keep coming back and haunting you. Its yoke is broken off your neck right now. Amen. Right now. At this moment, in the name of Jesus, it is broken off your neck right now. You leave this place to be healed, set free, and delivered from this thing that is haunting you. I wish I could get a church to give me some praise in this place tonight. You can go do your job now. If you're here today, I want to tell you something. If you struggle with things in your mind, you suffer from depression, anxiety, and things that hold you down and bind you, God is no respecter of persons. And just like he told me he was going to deliver Bree today at that moment, if I said that prayer, he's saying it to you too. You do not have to bend under that bondage and that oppression anymore. You just got to choose. Come up and allow one of these altar workers, preferably Bree, because she just got delivered, to pray for you. So you don't have to live under that oppression anymore. It is time for the church to become the church. If you struggle here today, I beg you today not to leave this place with that oppression over your life, but allow one of these altar workers to pray with you. Because God is no respecter of persons. He might love Bree a little more than me, but he's no respecter of persons. Today is a special day. But I'm going to tell you something. God says, if you deny me before man, I'll deny you before my father. And no longer are we looking for lukewarm, bottle-fed Christian babies who want to come here that you're afraid to get up and allow someone to see you get prayed for. If you're here in this place and you have never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, first and foremost, priority right there. Let's get you on the right path. Let's put him in the middle of your chaos and, the, and causing your life to go back for the good. You come and you walk forward and you allow one of these altar workers to pray with you. Can I tell you, if you are not bold enough to walk up in front of people who will cheer for you to get saved, you definitely won't do anything for them out there on the streets. So you might as well just stay in your seat. But if you're here today and you're like, Lord, I want to make a difference. I want you in my life. I want to do what it is you call me to go. Here's a black piece of paper with my signature on the bottom. What is it you want me to do this year? Right. If you feel the day like you need to make a time with him right here in the center section have, and stand at his feet, or if you need to go a little deeper, the altar is open for those that stand beside us. I'll pray with you today. But if you are today and you've not been saved, you've not been born again, I need you to come up. Because part of the thing is to come up and ask one of them to lead you in a prayer. And you can announce that I've been saved. You've got to go tell somebody. And for the rest of you here, I'm going to ask you to do what it is God called you to do. And that's to worship him. And to spend at least the next five minutes worshiping him with no disturbances. Nobody going out. Nobody yelling and screaming. Because there are people in their seats right now who suffer from depression and anxiety. Who that has got them bound so much that they can't get up out of their seat and come allow them. Because they're afraid of what they might say. What you might think. What they, like they're just sitting there. And if you will praise him. In his praise, he'll begin to usher in their spirit, and he'll know they're talking to him, and he will draw them forward that they can leave this place healed and delivered. 
You are as much involved as that as he is. Take them on out, Teresa.